This is the Analyzing Anfield podcast on the Blood Red channel, bringing you the best tactical and statistical analysis of Liverpool FC. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, the first official episode of 2020. I am rejoined by David Hughes. How are you doing, mate? Triumphant return, mate. Well, not, not for Evan, not for Evan, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's okay. This is a Liverpool podcast, so it's happy days. Yeah, but you uh, you missed out on New Year, didn't you? Uh, Christian stood in. For yeah, week. he did. Hero. Um, I hope people aren't too disappointed that I'm back. But um, we, had a, <laughs> we had a worthy substitute in the form of uh, the OG Christian. Yeah, did you bring in the New Year? Okay, though, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was good, mate. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was nice to have some time off. Uh, obviously, we haven't. We were talking before. We haven't really done a pod for a few weeks by our standards. Is a lifetime, isn't it? No, it feels it feels a while, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but we've only missed two games, actually. Mm. Like, you know, Liverpool games to cover is, is, is what I mean there. Uh, Sheffield United, obviously the Everton game, which I'm sure you're looking forward to. <laughs> and we're going to look ahead to the Spurs game as well. But uh, you know, we'll we'll get straight into it and we'll go we'll go to Sheffield United, which I mean for me another another really, really impressive performance. Another another Leicester performance, really. Mm. Uh, you didn't actually speak about the Leicester game with me, did you? But I didn't, no. it was it was flawless and I thought I thought this one followed a similar theme. You was at the ground, wasn't you? And yeah. I was blown away. Um just utter utter dominance and I tweeted half time. Obviously, it was only one nil at half time, but I just tweeted how impressed I was with Liverpool, and I didn't really think the scoreline justified the performance at that stage of the game. I think they had an XG of around 0.75 at half time. So, you know, looking at that alone, you might think it was a fairly tight game, but God, the intensity from Liverpool was just phenomenal. They were, they were brilliant. They really, and it, I know it's hard to say. Um, it's hard to come up with new ways to to explain how good Liverpool have been this season, but just in that game, I was I was so impressed with them. Yeah, I mean, it was it was the we talk a lot on the show about dominance and things like that, and what you want from an analytical perspective to win a game and things. And I suppose this was this was pretty much that once again. It was Liverpool seventy five percent possession on the day, nineteen shots to three. Um, and the XG expected goals on a day was three for Liverpool and 0.9 for Sheffield United. I must say though that about 1.6 of that for Liverpool was Mane's goal. Because obviously Mane's goal, he he shoots close to goal, mm. it gets saved yeah. and then he puts into an open net. Mm. That goes down as two shots, mm. both very, very close to goal. So a yeah. little bit misleading that. But... It's- you know, certainly a deserved win from my perspective. And but they are hard to um, create chances against, aren't they? Sheffield they were. They, I, thought, I still thought they were on the day. Yeah, I, they were, I, yeah. I think we were, we were in control, but I think we generally struggled to actually penetrate the box. Yeah. I think that they're, they're good at... Um, back, back fives tend to do that to us mm. at Anfield. Um, Wolves did it. At the, at, you know, similar system and, yeah, a few weeks and that ago. sort of thing. Mm. You just... You almost pin yourself on the edge of the box, and it's easy to get into the final third. But to actually generate a chance, that's that you'd label as clear cut. Mm. I don't think we created that that many, but the XG suggests otherwise. It's a bit of a strange one. Mm. Yeah, that's again where maybe it, everything always needs some context to it, and XG is something I put in that in that department. Because um, as I said, watching the game, and obviously people watching and listening to us now probably caught the game as well. It felt a very comfortable uh, win and an impressive one at that because I do really like Sheffield United. Um, was you a little bit let down by them, or do you think it's you know Christmas I, period? I don't know because you know I watched them at the Etihad, um, and the they really did pose some questions of City. I thought City were rather fortunate to win on the day. That was two were, yeah. as well, wasn't it? Yeah, but the, the expected goals I think it was zero point nine each. So yeah. So I think that was a, I expected something maybe similar if Liverpool win at the best, but I just thought, yeah, all right, Sheffield United probably played better this season, but I just thought Liverpool was so good. I think Liverpool caused issues for Sheffield United and that's why they, they couldn't perform at a high level on the, de- on the day. Yeah, I think after the game, Chris Wilder, he did praise Liverpool, don't get me wrong, but he also had a little bit of a, little bit of a dig at his own players in terms of 
just letting letting Liverpool do what they want mm. to a, to a degree, but. I think there's only, I, I really do think there's only so much you can do. That that and was uh, one of those days for me. Definitely. Yeah, it, it, very very few teams in Europe can cope with Liverpool when they're that focused, that hungry without the ball. Um, and it it really was just an an impressive performance. Well, I uh, I showed you before, didn't I? I'd look at the PPDA from Liverpool on the day. It was just flatlined. It was just it, they just intense all game. Like there was no let up. Like we've talked sometimes about them maybe easing off, haven't they? To conserve energy, but maybe this this is what Wilder was hitting at is the he let them have it all their own way all game, but it was just relentless for the full course of the game. Yeah, I think it's it's the type of performance I've spoken about in the past about Liverpool having gears sort mm. of thing, and I think we used those gears based on the quality of the opponents, and I think against Sheffield United and against Leicester, we I think for me clearly we gave them two sides a lot of respect, mm. and you could tell by how focused we were during the match. I, I, I'm excited to see Liverpool this season in the latter stages of the Champions League mm. because I'm, I'm excited to see what this team's top, top level gear five mm. is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think in a lot of matches we can just coast through once we've took a lead or, or that sort of thing. And I think we've seen very sporadic periods of Liverpool in fifth gear. And I think last season we saw Liverpool in fifth gear against Bayern Munich maybe. At the new camp away, we were just okay. We lost three mm. nil, but for large periods of the match, Barcelona just couldn't breathe. Yeah, and people forget that, don't they? Scoreline narrative kind of impacts your memory on that game. But yeah, Liverpool didn't actually play too bad. Yeah, and I think Liverpool. Uh, I've got this thing where we, you know, we scored a lot of late goals and things, and I think that's a lot of fitness related. Um, and I'm just intrigued to see Liverpool in the Champions League later in the season and things like that. Just obviously when we go to City away as well. If we're still unbeaten at that time, if we get through City away, that could take us into an invincible season. But again, it probably would involve a gear five of Liverpool. And I'll be honest, just on uh, on these two games, prior to these... Everton and uh, Sheffield No, United. this is before them. Not Everton, so this is Leicester and oh, Sheffield yeah. United. I did say to myself, if Liverpool win these, I'm going to tip them to basically... Do an invincible season. And it's easier for me to say that then than some of the pool fans, but I I just can't see a team beating them. I think it's even on the off days they just find that they just seem to be doing enough. I think it, it would be really almost like a s like a Disney story mm. if Liverpool had to go thirty years without a Premier League title mm. and then to do it by going unbeaten. Mm. Getting a century of points mm. and obviously winning your first. That would be some way of actually yeah. like overcoming the hoodoo, if you like. But I do, I just, I do. I, uh, I find, you know, even you look last season, it was only City that beat Liverpool, wasn't it, all season? Yeah. So that was only one loss last season. And, and that was narrow as well. It was narrow. It was a tight game. It was decided by those moments that we talk about. And I uh, I must say, I just, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not jinxing it, you know, obviously from a Liverpool perspective, such words. But I just, I can't see a team. I think at the cup competitions are different. Champions League, you know, there's going to be a lot of questions asked there. That could be difficult juggling the latter stages of that. Um, I think the FA Cup, Klopp's obviously going to give the kids a good run for as long as they can stay in it. Um, but the Premier League, I think, they're so focused, so good, it's going to be really difficult for the side to beat them this year. Yeah. I mean, during the, the match with Sheffield United, one thing I picked up on, and wrote about was how Liverpool seemed to use a a situational back three at times. Um, a few people said that this is something Liverpool always do, which is true. But I don't think we do it to this extent. I think we did it a lot against Sheffield United, and I think it was a bit more, a bit more deliberate than usual, a bit more fixed than usual. Obviously, it can happen occasionally because it's a fluid system. But this seemed a little bit more intentional. I think. It makes sense when you look at Sheffield United. Obviously, Henderson played as the number six on the day, but he was inclined to drop in alongside Joe Gomez and Van Dijk to form a back three. Mm. And what that did was it outnumbered Sheffield United's front two and also cut off the channels that they were, dart they, they were darting into at Bramall Lane. Mm. And it also permitted Alexander-Arnold and Robertson to push up maybe an extra 10 yards, yeah. which forces back Sheffield United's wing-backs. Mm. Um, 
and it, it just worked. It, it was just really good way of. Um, I'm not, I think we did something a little bit similar eventually at Bramalene once we figured out what was going on. Mm. But we came into this one, I think, with the awareness that it was going to work from the off. But again, this you know, Chris Wilder will have probably went into it thinking we're facing a four four three, and maybe plenty will have came out of it thinking we faced a four four. Uh, 433 sorry mm. but it's it's those very very subtle adjustments within the confines of the, the system that you already know mm. that are so effective yeah I thought just on that point it is so fluid in those wide areas especially in that game that a lot of the time Trent was playing in the position that you'd expect Salah to be taken up and Salah would obviously drop deeper sometimes to maybe cl try and collect the ball from Henderson. And I think it's really difficult for a defender and midfielder to com communicate in those split seconds who's going to track Salah to yeah. stop him picking up the ball. And then obviously Trent remains in such an advanced position um, that, just, that the threat is always there. And I think Liverpool can do this because they're so comfortable with just staying with a, a 2v2 at times if the ball is lost, isn't it? The, the central defenders are playing so well. Yeah, they're so capable of yeah. coping, coping in isolation and stuff that like that. They're happy to run that risk, aren't they, if they're going 2v2 because they're confident that they'll at least slow the attack down enough for the players to drop back into defensive positions. So I think that's important to note that the, the comfort of the defence is obviously key to that working. Yeah, just a word on that actually. Might as well say this... You, we haven't, you haven't prepared in advance for this one, but I'm just going to throw it in there anyway. Uh, just a word on Joe Gomez, because yeah. I think he's picked up recently. Oh, yeah, he's been really And good. I think to the extent that you can clearly see why initially at the start of the season on the opening day, Klopp reverted back to the Van Dijk Gomez pairing. Mm. And he reverted back to Matip eventually once Gomez was a little bit shaky. But I think when you see Gomez playing like this, you see why he is, you know all things considered, Van Dijk's real partner. Mm -hmm. I think he's some player. Yeah, he is, yeah. But what I will say is, even when we were talking about him struggling, we always put the caveat in there of... He'll it, be back. Yeah, he yeah. will be back. It's hard to kind of come back up to full speed, isn't it? Um, and now he's played a fair few minutes since he's come back from injury and he looks he looks great. You know, that looks a really solid defensive partnership again. And, and now it's flipped to the point where we're saying... You know, is Matip probably going to have to struggle now to get back into the sides when he's fully fit again? It's a, it's a, it's a good headache to have for Klopp. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, but I think one one thing I've considered lately is that I think that the reason he's so suited to playing alongside Van Dijk and the reason when they both play and they're both on form, mm. we don't seem to ever concede. You know, that's five clean sheets in a row, by the way, mm. at the minute. Um, but I think Van, I think Gomez is is the, the closest to Van Dijk certainly at Liverpool in terms of his biggest strength being that he hasn't really got a weakness Gomez mm. obviously very very fast very aggressive good in the air good positionally and things like that strong He's, he is like a mini Van Dijk <laughs> that's a fair point yeah. there's, there's no real weaknesses you can play on regarding Gomez no. when he's on form it is like having a miniature Van Dijk mm. yeah no I totally agree yeah and it's um, obviously it's key to his development if he's playing in a alongside a similar player who's maybe still a level above what he is. Um, but yeah, I think it's Klopp potentially rearing him to, to be the main the main man going forward. Um, if Van Dijk does eventually, in a year or two, begin to have some form of drop-off. Yeah, I mean, it, it is five clean sheets in a row now. Um, and this is a little a staff from our producer guy who just sent me this... Um, those th those clean sheets derive from the, th the 3-0 win over Bournemouth in which Gomez reverted back to centre-back after Lovren was injured. So I'm not the type to to look at results when a single player is involved mm. and say that, you know, we are yet to concede the goal when, I don't know, Naby Keita is on the picture. I'm not, I'm not particularly a believer in that. But I do think that Gomez is inclined to make a, a big difference not in terms of Liverpool's overall defensive game, but a big difference in certain moments. Like mm. there was a moment against Wolves when a ball was played over the top, Trent slipped, and I think it was Vinagre 
was through on goal. Yeah. Um, and if that's Lovren and Gomez slips, or if that's Matip and Gomez slips, not Gomez, if that's Matip and Trent slips, and if that's Lovren You would have got away slips, with that, no one was going to play. Right? <laughs> go on, yeah. They don't make up that ground. Mm. They don't recover in, in enough time to put off mm. Vinagre before he takes the shot. Gomez is, he's just got that extra yard to the extent that he might not fully recover, but he'll put the player off enough for him not to, to score. Do you yeah. see what I mean? I, yeah, I, think I think that's where the differences come in with clean sheets. Mm, I think he uses his body really well. That's what I've noticed about Gomez. He he just seems to position himself really well. He uses his strength where, it you know, it's it, it's no risk of fouls. It's just really clever play. He, he's, I, just a, he, he's just a really... He's, I think he's got, he's got the perfect blend, hasn't he, of physique and power yeah. with the pace. He's not like... A tactical now as well. Yeah, he's not like tall enough to the extent that he's like rigid and mm. difficult mover. But he's not slow enough. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely, yeah. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a really good player. Yeah, just one more thing on Sheffield United. You know, the opening goal came from a ball over the top again. Um, but we did, we did similar at Bramall Lane. Mm. But there was a moment at Bramall Lane we couldn't break through them. Van Dijk hit a ball over the top to Mane. Mane really should have scored. Um, and this time, the ball was hit over the top to Lallana. Maybe not Lallana. Lallana wasn't even playing. Robertson it was. I think a Sheffield United player slipped. It got played to um, to Mane and Mane scored. So mm. these balls over the top really do seem to be playing a part lately. Just yeah. such an effective basic means of build-up that a lot of teams... I think there's almost an obsession with building from the back, whereas I think Liverpool just openly mix it up. Yeah, and, they've and still got the most long balls in the Premier League, haven't they? Yeah, 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 I think so, yeah, which you would commonly look at as an unattractive mm -hmm. three, but if you're hitting them on target and they're effective, yeah. it's just another problem for the opposing team to, to deal with, I suppose. What I, um, what I found, because I was doing a bit of a opposition analysis from a United point of view, um not so long ago on Wolves and obviously Liverpool play Wolves um, just before that um, what I noticed with Liverpool's long balls is they, they are like a double-edged sword because for start I think the likes of Mane is actually really underrated in the air I think he's, he is good in the air despite his size but also I think Liverpool are so quick in the second phase aka sweeping up the loose balls that a lot of the time it can it can advance them into the, the final third very quickly where someone else will the, the defence might win the initial header, but Liverpool always seem to pick up the second ball and suddenly they're in the final third with attackers around them. And it, be, it just becomes a really good um, attacking sequence of play, really. Yeah, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. Mm. I think it was an impressive performance, one of our best this season. Mm. Um, it, for me, it can tally up close to, to the Leicester performance, I think. Um, and we get out with another win. Mm. But we'll move on now to, to the Everton talk. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, it's just a start, general thoughts on the game. I mean, we don't we don't usually go into detail on, on domestic cups, but with this being a derby and with this going the way it went, I think it's it justifies a chat, especially considering we've got spares to, to address and then we haven't got another match then because United will be next week. So just general thoughts on the, on the derby and how it went. <laughs> <laughs> from what point of view? <laughs> <laughs> Just no, general perception, yeah. you know, from both sides. Um, really impressed by Liverpool's team on the day. Um, really impressed, but not surprised either. Um, I think Everton should be ashamed of themselves, really. Uh, what did you expect? What, like, as in... What, as in, to, after results? the team to come out, as in we knew the lineups. Yes. Yeah. I expected a difficult game but I expected Everton to maybe show a little bit more composure, take control and use a little bit more experience to to go on and problem. I, I, I didn't I didn't expect an Aston Villa score line, put it that way. I didn't expect no. a 5-0, but I thought maybe 2 or 3, 2-0, 3-1, something like that, um, provided they were controlled. But yeah, the... Um, they were their own worst enemy. I thought, as I said, you wouldn't. There's no way you're going to get away with it against any Liverpool side at Anfield because they're so so strong. No, I think, I think for me it, it did go mostly as I expected it to go. Although I would say that 
I thought Everton would consider, would convert one of their chances. Um, I suppose you can blame A, Adrian for that and B, maybe a lack of quality finishing mm. on the day. Definitely the last, yeah. Um, and yeah, I just I just think it was an impressive performance from Liverpool's perspective, but mm. I, I, I did think that with the quality on show on the day, you know, Everton having their first choice 11 out, I just thought they'd have a bit too much quality. Yeah, that's why I expect them just edge in most departments. A lot of it really for experience, but... Um, I mean, the, the goal had decided the match we will get to. Mm. But I thought that if, if you look at the teams on the day, I thought that if any player was going to produce a moment like that, it would be in the Everton ranks. Yeah, yeah, it's same. Because um, that, that's a quality finish, isn't it? That's yeah. like oh, it's, the it's, next it's, finish. Maybe. Say, I'm looking forward to talking about him. We'll come on to him in a bit. But yeah, it's, it's really hard to, to kind of discuss things from, from an Everton point of view because... It was just so poor, um, but I was yeah I was really pleased with. Well, I wouldn't say I was pleased, but I was impressed <laughs> with Liverpool. You know, I did say even I've said to you, haven't I? Even those chances that Everton created for me, they were against the run of play from start to finish. I thought Liverpool dominated the game. They were the better side on the day, and they did deserve the chances, even if they lost the the xG. Yeah, I mean we'll split it up into two halves. I think the first half, Liverpool showed the intent. Liverpool showed the, you know, the, you could see, you see they were trying to instill the identity of Liverpool that Klopp has established. But I think I think it offered an insight into so many teams try to try to have this dominant style of play where mm. you're pressing highly, mm. and o- always the byproduct of those teams is you you don't face many shots, but when you do. The clear cut. Mm. That's the byproduct of Manchester City at the minute. That was the byproduct of Everton under Marco Silva. Mm. If you press highly, you you don't usually face many shots, but when you do, they're usually quite clear cut. Mm. Liverpool, I I think, are the best in Europe at mixing a high press with, you know, when the sh- shots do come, they're still not that clear cut. Mm. They're still quite difficult from difficult angles, and you've still got players around you and things mm. and. I think this match offered an insight into how good Liverpool's usual defence is. Mm. Because in the first half, as you say, we dominated. But when the shots came, they were clear cut and really should have been converted. Yeah. Yeah. I think um I think the set piece one, Paul Gates' chance was a poor one to concede from a Liverpool point of view, because that was just a, a, a loft of ball into the into the area, which there was two or three Everton players really lining up for it. Well, I, th- I think if that was Liverpool's usual defence, he probably would have been offside. Yeah, because he played the line. They literally better. hold the line mm. until the ball is kicked. But I think so many players are so inclined to, as the player approaches the kick, you mm. just naturally start drifting towards yeah. your own goal. Well, it's it's it, it, it's I suppose you could argue it's just not being familiar with that kind of um, environment that you do in these things. You know, the psyche does come into it, and you are you are just feeling a little bit more under pressure then, which may then, may then cause a little bit of nerves. And as you said, a split second, you might stop holding the line and drop a little bit deeper, which plays someone on side. What I will say is, you know, it didn't it didn't help Liverpool in the sense that they lost Milner after a few minutes as well, because he's an experienced yeah. head on the pitch. And they lost him, brought in uh, LaRucci. I'm not sure on pronunciation. LaRucci. LaRucci. I must um, say he did well. Yeah, I've watched him a lot actually. He's a, I've actually saw him play right back, right mid, and up front. He's a, <laughs> he's such a versatile player. But once he'd settled into the game, I thought it took him a little while, and Everton had joy down his side. But once he settled into the game, um, it seemed to have almost translate into the other players as well. And the whole back line then looked very relaxed as the longer the game went on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you move on to the second half, mm. I think. We seem to continue to dominate per seasons, but I think we shored up the whole clear cut chances every now and then mm. aspect. I think we, I don't really think we we faced many shots at all in the second half. I'm not sure if that was due to to Liverpool or to do with. I think for me, there was an element of Everton just freezing. I was about to say there was a moment early on in the second half where to me it felt like Liverpool's players realised. The younger lads realised we could we can go out and win this game from here, and Everton 
almost started to shrink a little bit and it looked there seemed to be a lot of questioning themselves and overthinking decisions on the ball yeah yeah just it, it seemed a completely different mentality in both sides which obviously ended up why Liverpool became so controlling in the game and Everton were very very poor yeah it was almost as though Everton, Everton players were playing with a backpack on the shoulders that was packed full of burden almost mm. and yeah. Liverpool's players were just playing with complete freedom yeah no and expect- hunger as well yeah no real expectation on the shoulders I also thought it helped that um, Pedro Chirivella yeah in, another one who played well oh yeah he just he seems to he was playing pretty well throughout the game but he, he just clicked in he clicked didn't he in the second half and you know he's he was brilliant to find the spaces to pick, come and pick up the ball um, great vision with the ball great passing uh, you know, it was just a really brilliant performance by him. It's probably a little bit of a shame that he'll he'll never maybe make it at Liverpool. It might be one of his only performances. Yeah, in it's, the prob- first it's, team. it's probably the best I've seen him play though. Mm. Um, just his composure on the ball and the the way he was inclined to break lines with his passes, mm. I thought it was impressive. He was he, brave, he, wasn't he? If you spotted the pass and opening ahead of him, he'd just play one of those through passes along mm. the floor allowing maybe Minamino to, to receive the ball and turn and, and run at Everton's last line sort of thing. Mm. Um, but, you know, Liverpool ended the match with, with more possession. I think it was 58%. One more shot attempt and two more shots on target, which it is a, a bit omin- ominous considering Liverpool's arguably third strings there mm. up against Everton's first team. But I do think in this match, the whole mentality aspect of it came into it positively on Liverpool's side, mm. negatively on Everton's side. Mm. Um, but we'll, we'll move on to, to the goal scorer. Yeah. yeah. Curtis Jones. Mm. I thought he was superb on the day. I've, I've been impressed with him whenever I've seen him. Yeah. Um, I know you see the, the occasional academy, academy match yeah. of his. So I, uh, I've i been really watching him quite well on a regular basis since he was playing under Gerrard in the 18s. Um so I've watched him probably maybe two, two and a half full seasons now on a regular basis. And yeah, he's, he's always looked a great player, great talent. Um, I said to you before that, you know, you forget he's 18 because I watch him in the 23s now and he looks seasoned. He looks he looks like when a first team player comes down in the 23s to play games, to get, build a little bit of fitness or to get a run out. He, he just looks head and shoulders above everybody else. And, the fact that he's only eighteen and he's doing that, because you know, if he if he wasn't developing that at the set at the speed he is, he could still be playing in the eighteens. Yeah, I but, think he's considerably developed for eighteen. Yeah, and I think most of the Premier League clubs he'd be now in and around mm. the first team for the starting yeah. place. Just Liverpool's a different story at the minute, but I, I do still think, think he's, he's got a place in this. No, the way we were talking about Travella then. Yeah, I don't for me think he's going to make it Liverpool. No, Obviously, I my think he's twenty two Travella. Yeah, well. but. Jones, I think over the next six to twelve months, he could be better than the side, and because there's no there's no pressure on them, is it? Because the way Liverpool are, they they don't need him to be an instant success. Though he can just use him as and when and get him adjusted. You've said many a time about how good Klopp is at bedding players in. I think he could be a, a regular certainly over the next I do. season. Also. I do. I've got written down here for me. He is a future first teamer. Nice. I'd go as far as saying that. Mm. Um, to, to, to be a first team for Liverpool, you haven't just got to be good and you haven't just got to be a local lad. You've got to fit in with the identity of, of the playing style and you've got, to, you've, got, you've got to epitomise and personify what Klopp's trying to do, basically. And I think Jones does. I, you know, he's intense, physically really, really good. He's you know, six foot one, despite, despite the fact he's 18. He's aggressive. He's mobile. Um, technically good. Versatile, he, you know, he started in midfield, he ended the match on left left wing, I think. Mm. Um, obviously homegrown as well, which is a, a, a positive. Mm. Clearly very driven mentally. Um, and you know, best of all, he's a scout. Produces big moments. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. produces big moments, yeah. Um, but I think all of those, he, he suits the profile of a Liverpool midfielder, a, a Liverpool type of player. Mm. And for me, if, if you look at I mean, I, I might be going a little bit too far here, but if, if you look at Jordan Henderson, Henderson's 29, James Milner, Milner's 34, 
those two, I think, act as the, the spine of, of Liverpool's squad, almost homegrown. Mm. Um, just adding that English aspect to, to the team in the midfield. And I think, obviously, with those being the, that age and Jones being 18, Liverpool are going to get to a point sometime soon where we need to start looking at maybe homegrown players to start being introduced to the team mm-hmm. because obviously Trent's in there but beyond beyond Trent in the actual first choice 11 there's not a great deal of of um, of homegrown players there mm-hmm. and I think I think there's the option for, for Jones to just gradually I mean gradually very very slowly over a long period of time take over the mantle of, of what Milner and Henderson are doing and almost do what do what Carragher and Gerrard did mm. as Jones and Ar- Alexander Arnold. Mm. Maybe Jones won't reach that level, but I do think he's good enough to to certainly play a part for Liverpool moving forward. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, he's got a. Um, think I'm going too far there? No, I don't. You know, all you can do with it. Nobody's got a uh, a mystic ball we've seen into the future, have we? At the end of the day, you can only gauge what you're seeing now. And um, right now, he seems to have really high ceiling. He's just produced a huge moment in a big game. He's been doing it at youth level for a good few years now. I, I totally agree. I think he, it's exciting. I'd actually, if, as well, I'd probably avoid sending out on loan as well over the next year and just see if he could be bedded into the side and see if if he steps up again. Um, he's, he's an exciting player. and he, he's If so, somebody's asked me this before, if there's anyone coming through that, I think he could make it at Liverpool. I think he's definitely one of them, Curtis Jones. Yeah. I mean, the other week we did the Q&A and I was asked about Gerrard and whether Gerrard's suitable to mm. eventually taking over from Klopp. And, you know, I tried to provide a bit of info in that it's it's not just a case of he's a scouser who's a legend at the club. He Gerrard is suited to what Liverpool are doing in terms of being suited to the band of football and all that stuff. And I think Jones is similar. It's not just a case of him being a local lad who's decent. It's suitability to what Klopp's after, mm. the, you know, the versatility and mm. the, the intensity and he's clearly very driven and all that. He, he suits exactly what Liverpool would target. Mm. It makes sense considering he's 18 rather than going and spending money on a player like that. Yeah. Just just work on him. Yeah, and totally I think Klopp yeah. said after the match, 100% a Liverpool player if, if nothing weird goes wrong, I think he said something like that. Um, <laughs> so I think he's a player that we're going to... That's a very Klopp comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. But I think he's a, he's a player that I think we're going to see. And I think by the time Klopp leaves in 2024, is it? Hopefully he doesn't. But if Klopp leaves in, in that period, you know, that's that's four years from now. Jones will be 22. Hmm. I'd expect Still him, just 22, that's mad. Yeah, it is mad. But I'd expect him around that period then to be, you know, to be doing what what Milner's doing now, what Wijnaldum's doing now, hmm. what the Lions doing now, what Kayser's doing now, just yeah. in terms of like in and out the side and, and stuff like that. Yeah. I agree, yeah, totally. Um, but I, I think the match, this is important to say, I think the match offered, it, offered an insight into the, the difference between the two clubs. Mm. Obviously, we're going to record analysing Everton after this <laughs> podcast. Yeah. I'm probably going to address a little bit more then. Mm. But I think it was clear that one club has an identity throughout, yeah, top to bottom, and the other club doesn't. Yeah, it is, yeah. I, I agree. Um, I mean... You know, I think there's actually a really good lesson, not even just for Everton. I think there's just a good lesson for a lot of sides up and down the country when looking at Liverpool. Now, I I watched Liverpool, as I mentioned, um, youth sides a fair bit. And take the under-23s when I watch them. They play almost identical to how um, the first team do. So they'll play a 4-3-3. The defence will have a high line and they'll play that high line. Now, I, I haven't looked back further than this, but I know Liverpool haven't won any of the previous seven PL2 titles. So that's the, for people who don't know, it's the basically reserve Premier League. Mm-hmm. Liverpool haven't won any of them over the last seven years. Then you look at Everton. They've won two of the last three. I think United have won the two before that. But I also watch a lot of Everton's reserve sides. Now, Everton, un- under David Unsworth, 
often play like a four five one where they sit in a low block so very deep and try and hit sides on the counter and it's effective it works and they get results but that's not development for the first team yeah if you'd have introduced one of those players to a Marco Silva team, high pressing and things. Exactly. He's struggling. Yeah, that's it. How can you better player and develop their skills to step up into the first team when they are basically drilling different forms of football every week? Um, Liverpool don't do that. And what Liverpool are doing is they sacrifice results at that level, as it should be for development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why you can see this team come in, that come in on Sunday be so successful in playing the same way that the first team play because of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I think it's really important to flag that um, and to listen to, to other clubs up and down the country. Yeah, no, you spot on. I can't really add much more to that. Mm. I think, you know, I've said, said to you before that I think if both clubs on the day played shadows and you, you didn't see the kits and mm. things like that, you would know which team was Liverpool and you probably wouldn't know that that was Everton, mm. even though that that was Everton's first team yeah. and it was Liverpool's third strings, mm. it, it it is mad. Um, but it just shows that it's, it's a product of Liverpool having got here like that. This this is a product of working for, for a number of years now. Klopp's been at Liverpool for about, I think, four or five years or so. Mm. And this is, this is the product of that gradual, mm. you know, working over time. And I, I remember when Klopp first got the job, you know, the, the next day he was with um, Alex Inglethorpe at the academy, mm. just watching the kids with a coffee in his hand, talking to Inglethorpe about, you know, ideas and things. That, and it's clear that, like, so many years later, we're in a position where, I, you know, that word again aligned mm. from, from top to bottom sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but we'll move on anyway to, to the upcoming match. Spares. Mm. Spares away. Now, we spoke a few weeks ago. Uh, about you know we got asked didn't we which which team other than City is best suited to to defeating Liverpool I think it was basically and one of the answers we gave Mourinho had just been appointed was Mourinho Spurs mm. um, would you still entirely go along with that or, or have you ah. taken a bit of a knock by by, by I, what they've shown yeah I have actually I don't think there's been a huge advancement in in kind of what they've been doing under Mourinho. I think there's been changes, but, you know, firstly, let's point out, I think he's lost that psychological impact that a Mourinho appointment may have done in times gone by. Mm. I think the results don't look that great either. In fact, you've got them here, haven't you? Well, you can leave it to go on to them in a second. Um, but no, I'm, I'll be honest, uh, I'm starting to think... I think there'll always be an edge with any Mourinho side, but I think Liverpool could quite easy, easily win on the day. Yeah, I, th I think it, it 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 looks as though the honeymoon period has came and gone really, really, really quickly. Really quick, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if there's discontent in the camp or not. I don't think there is. But it, it, it does seem to have gone a little bit, I don't know, cold, stale, Grumpy, not Mourinho per se, but just the, the overall scenario of the club seemed to be lifted really, really quickly, and now it's back to Pochettino levels really, really. Yeah, quickly. I not, was not particularly bad, but just I was going to say to you, you know, if you look at them now, if you look at them in the, the from, since he's come in, metrics wise, results wise, basically everything, and someone said to you, Pochettino is still manager, you'd kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. expect it, wouldn't you? Yeah, there hasn't really been, especially recently, yeah, um, because. One thing Pochettino maybe, you know, fell down on late, late in his tenure at Spurs was he was changing all the time, changing systems and formations and things like that. And that, that, was, that, that, that was fine once when, when the principles of play were in place. Mm. But those principles of play gradually got lost. Mm. They stopped pressing and things like that and they lost an identity, I suppose. Um, and Mourinho came in and, you know, 4 2 three, one, and he kept that week after week after week after week and it was working. In the past three weeks, the past three matches, they've used three different formations. 3-4-3, mm. three, 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 and 4-3-2-1, three, Christmas tree formation. Um, and that's just that's never a good sign. I know that the, 
few injuries here and there and things like that. And but it's just I, I'm not sure why he's I'm not particularly sure why he's diverted from the four two three one that he seems to be. He seems to have decided four two three one's a good shape for this team, mm. and he's gradually moved away from it. Yeah, it's, did you say that was last three games, didn't you? Last three matches, yeah. See so what you find, don't you? Normally, when it, a manager's being quite tactically fluid, shall we say, is maybe they're trying to nullify strengths of the opposition. But I don't know if that was just league games or was that league and cup. That was Premier League only. Or Premier League only. I mean, you look at the teams he faced: Southampton, Norwich, and Brighton. Like for yeah. me, you should be as Tottenham. You should be imposing yourself on the game, and it should be on that those particular opponents to maybe try and nullify your strengths. But it's the point I'm trying to make is I don't think he's changing them to try and nullify the quality of the opposition because they should have better quality on paper. It seems I he's mean, maybe struggling to find the winning formula. Yeah, I mean maybe it's been um, it's a, a means of managing the Christmas period or something. Mm. Maybe, maybe he's had to rotate plenty and things like that and as a result he's had to balance formations and things but what um, what do you actually think of just generally the um, the Tottenham squad all start, starting 11 sides when, when he came in I thought it was uh, I thought the appointment was up, was fine and I thought it was um, interesting because Mourinho is a a short term winner mm-hmm. really he gets short term r- results out of a squad he wasn't suited to the United job because the United squad wasn't ready to win mm. it was it had to go undergo a period of development and I don't think Mourinho was particularly a development type I looked at the Spurs squad when he first came in and I thought that's a squad that's clearly been developed over the years under Pochettino they've now aged a little bit got a bit more experience they technically are in a place right now to win mm. plenty of players in there that are ready to win immediately mm. Ericsson yeah. Deli Alli Kane players like this mm. Alvarald for and they've all been around yeah. um, so I didn't think it'd be that that bad but they've suffered a few injuries and Don has been in and out who I think is going to be crucial to them they haven't really got a midfield they haven't really got you know right backs and left backs a little bit dodgy Harry Kane's now got an injury so Soko still playing in midfield mm-hmm. so I think the squad is is a bit of a mess but initially I looked at it and thought that's a squad that short term could be well suited to what Mourinho is, is usually after mm. see what I mean yeah no I, I do yeah I agree with most of that one I'm what I'm wondering is, I just wonder whether some of those players you mentioned, they just don't seem to have that psychological extra 10 to 20% to perform for Tottenham anymore, you know. They do, they do seem to have, as a group, lost a bit of hunger. Yeah, hunger, that's that's the term I'm looking for, hunger. They look you know. tired to me. Yeah, Ericsson just doesn't seem the same player. You know, most of the back line looked like they were going to be leaving in the summer. You know, you look at like Rose, for example, he... He stayed behind, I think, actually, on, on, on pre-season to get a move. Didn't happen. He's he's like a starter for them. Um, it's it's just a very bizarre side, and yet they just they don't seem like they've got that real competitive edge in them. Um, yeah, I mean, Deli Ali's a player who seems to still have a bit of an edge to him. Mm. I think, but, but, but I don't know, beyond that, just... I don't know, certain players just seem a, a little bit I don't know, I'm not particularly bothered. Yeah, um, there, but not really. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, I suppose, that's the opposite with Liverpool. Mm. Um, but Mourinho's record since he came in at Spurs in the league, Premier League, five wins, one draw, three losses. Based on those results, he would be, if the Premier League season started when he came in, he'd be fifth in the table at the minute. Um, Spurs are seventh in that time. Mm. For expected goals, yeah. Since Mourinho came in, mm. um, and I think defensively as as well, they haven't been. I mean, y- you expect the Mourinho team to be watertight, really, don't you? Yeah, robust. Yeah, that's kind of one of his one of the aspects of his game that you think. Well, at least you're going to get someone come in and and basically sort the defense out. But um, they're actually fourth for expected goals against, which. I expect it to actually be a bit worse than that. Yeah, I was just about to say, yeah. I thought but, it would um, be a little bit worse. They have shipped a fair few. I think they've probably underperformed, looking at it, in terms of expected goals mm. against. They've probably conceded more than they should have. They yeah. conceded two against West Ham on the first day. Uh, two against United, I think. I think things like that. It's become apparent as well that Hugo Luis was a, is a bit of a miss as well because, um, you know, 
probably people listening have seen various. I um, mean, that guy's an eager dropkick yeah. against Chelsea was daft. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what yeah. he was doing I don't, there. I don't rate him at all. Whereas Luis, although he has a tendency to make mistakes, he's he's a keeper that seems to often overperform against his XG, doesn't he? And, you know, produce good saves. So I think they've missed him. Um, and we already know, don't we, that when you don't have your, your number one in place, it does impact you. Um, the yeah, rest yeah, of the defence. But um, I think Mourinho said, I mean, he, he said in, insistently, I thought that he's got a team that can defend and a team that can attack, mm. but not a team yet that can do both at the same time, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Whether that's to do with the players mm. or, you know, not having enough time to coach them or whatever, but he, he seems to think at the minute that he can't, he can't really do both. Hence why if they score goals, he tends to concede. And if they don't score goals, it tends to be boring. Yeah. You see what I mean? It's tough to balance the two. Yeah, obviously mm. Liverpool are arguably the best at balancing the two because of the players and things like that. Mm. Um, but I think one thing that I picked up on looking at their results, obviously he's won five. Um, they seem to have struggled against any team that you'd label as good. So they were beaten comfortably by Chelsea. And I'm talking comfortably in terms of expected goals mm. beneath the surface. Comfortably by United. Mm. and comfortably by Southampton and he drew you know the expected goals was ve- fairly even against against Wolves although they ended up winning that match 2-1 um, so that's even, a little bit ominous for, yeah. for the Liverpool meeting <laughs> yeah I suppose as well that um, even even that Wolves result though that come fairly early on didn't he he's played uh, played about five games since then I think they got outplayed as well for the majority of that match yeah. I think they just that was one of them fluke games that mm. just tends to happen every now and then. Where it goes your way. So, yeah, it'll be, um, I said, it's a little bit of a different Tottenham over these last couple of weeks. Um, and they probably couldn't have picked a worse result, um, worse opponent than Liverpool. No. I mean, from perspective of Mourinho, though, he mm. does tend to do quite well against Liverpool when he's at home. Mm. Uh, we struggled against United for years. Um and we, it, it, you know, hopefully he can't carry that into the Spurs team. But it, 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 I always generally dread facing the Mourinho team away from home. I always wonder as well how, how much, on top of the needle that was already there, if he holds anything against Liverpool for basically being the ones that got him sacked from the United job. I think he was ready to go anyway, but they were the ones that obviously put the uh, the final nail in the coffin. Um and Mourinho does tend to find a way to spoil parties for Liverpool. Um, I think back to obviously the most famous one, the Chelsea, Chelsea results, uh, the two 0 So yeah, I, I'm just having a look at um, guys. Have you seen guys stat? Yeah, uh, uh, no. Producer. Go on. Yeah, guys fired another one over, and he's just saying Mourinho's only lost one of his last five against Liverpool, um, and that, that was, was the game that when he got sacked. When he got sacked, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, in that time, there's been obviously the one win, three three draws, including two nil nils. So Mourinho is quite happy to, as I just said, spoil the party a little bit, isn't he? And he, he's happy to forego his own in, attacking intent just to nullify Liverpool, really. And I'm expecting him to do that. Well, do, do, do you know what? Considering Liverpool are unbeaten, there's no one out there that would want to end that oh, aye, yeah. more than Mourinho. Yeah. Knowing what he's like. His history with Liverpool and things like that, he will be really relishing that. And mm. I, I, I'm fairly certain it will be in his team talk, mm. the fact that they've got the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about yourself, but I am expecting a back three on the day from, from Spurs because that mm. seems to work at United for about, I don't know, two or three consecutive years in a row at Old Trafford. Mm. Uh, they just they, they seem to get tight to Salah in particular. And Mane just forcing them backwards whenever they get the ball really on the toes and stepping on the heels and things like that. Um, and they, they place the emphasis on Liverpool's deeper players to actually, you know, do something because they, they just they just clog out Salah and, and Liverpool's attackers out the game completely. The positive is that Liverpool now have since Alexander Arnold. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Van Dijk, <laughs> Robertson, you know, players like that. Shame we don't have Fabinho. Yeah. But we do have players that are a bit more capable maybe than, than in the past. Mm, yeah, because it was, yeah, what what game stood out for me was the um, the meeting at Old Trafford last year where Shaw, I think it was Shaw, uh, had a rare decent game against Salah um, and yet he did really well in terms of kind of nullifying him but now you've got 
you've got Trent there as well. I think it's just, <laughs> if you try and deploy those tactics, I think Liverpool will find an answer for it this time. So it's that double jeopardy thing, mm, isn't it? That we've mentioned a few times. Yeah, yeah it's uh, Liverpool, a, a, a different team this season. And yeah, I'll be, because uh, Trent didn't play in that game, did he? I think he... Oh, no, he might not have. No. Might think, have been Milner, that. Yeah, he played Milner, I'm sure he did. It was it was when Klopp I think, seemed to be going through a phase of being a little bit more conservative in the bigger games. Yeah, but I think a year, a year before that, I think Trent got roasted by mm. by Rashford. So with it being a bad old Stratford memory, I yeah. suppose, I think he went for Milner. But it's obviously been two years on now and he's developed, hasn't he? Yeah, no. and this is away from old Stratford. Mm. It's maybe not as, as emotional yeah. with it being a new stadium and things like that. Um. But one one final point I'd like to make regarding the game. I think one one flaw in Spurs' current game um, is set pieces. Mm. I, th- I think it's maybe a bit of a flaw in Mourinho's game as well, you know. Mm. They seem to concede set pieces, not particularly uh, well drilled from them at the minute. They conceded from set piece against Brighton, from set piece against Chelsea, Olympiacos and West Ham. Um so that that's four teams. I'm not particularly sure how many matches he's played. He's played nine. So against four of those nine teams, mm. a set piece has, has been scored. Mm. And I'm talking a set piece as in from a corner kick or from a set piece or from a free kick deliv- delivery that's been headed home. So yeah, I think it's an interesting note just simply because of how li- how how much Liverpool tends to use those moments. Yeah, when it's a tight game, you know, set pieces have sometimes the side of fixtures for Liverpool haven't they um, and yeah that that is really I'm, important to note I'm thinking Chelsea away actually because Chelsea away was a tough game mm. the performances between both teams was roughly a draw mm. but Trent scored a free kick and Firmino scored a header from mm. a free kick yeah. and that basically won us the game so mm. this might be one of those matches where it's a tough game all round really the competition's fairly even between both boxers but Liverpool just use set pieces to actually secure the actual result mm, and yeah. the three points. Yeah, I agree with that. It's so, a, uh, that could be imperative. Yeah, five on Van Dijk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Did you say that once? And he, was it when he scored two? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've said it a yeah. few times. Just when I well, it, well if you do when he uh, scores, you know, you know, Josh a tenner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and double as much. I'll set up a PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so verdict anyway. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go two 0 Liverpool. As easy as that. Mm, yeah, and it, it may not be. Uh, it may not be uh, easy in terms of the actual gameplay itself, but I think I think the results will be in the bag. Yeah. I I don't think Spurs will score. Uh, I think Liverpool seem well drilled at the minute. Really intense. Joe Gomez is included. Spurs have got no Harry Kane. Things like that. So I don't think we'll concede. I do think. That they'll be really aggressive and on our toes and standard Mourinho, mm. you know, template. Uh, so I don't think it'll be a particularly nice game. But I do think Spurs are vulnerable from set pieces. I think they're vulnerable in transition when the balls are loose. I think mm. Liverpool can counter them mm. and things like that. So I'm probably going to go with with a 2-0. I'll, I'll go with a 2-0 with you. But there's just the obvious caveat, isn't it? That it's Mourinho away from mm. home. He just has this in him. Mm. He just... I don't know. You just never know with him. You, this could be his this, moment. This of the could season, easily yeah. be a loss. It mm. feels like it could be a loss. It's strange, um, but I don't. I'm going to go with two 0 I think. The thing is, even if it isn't a loss, it doesn't feel like it. It, it impacts things points wise on the table too much, does it? No. If it, so much good work has been done up until this point that you can kind of have an off day or a bad result and still be in pole position. Yeah, I mean the positive thing is when Liverpool do seem to have an off day. They still seem to not lose, yeah. you know, the, the draw or, or whatever. So, you know, we'll see how it goes, but be an interesting one. And we will be we will be back next week to, you know, back to normal now in terms of Thursdays mm. to talk about, obviously, the upcoming Manchester United fixture. Mm. Big one. And whatever's ahead of that. <laughs> uh, one, game, one game at a time. Yeah, one yeah. game at a time, yeah. Uh, so thanks for joining us again, Dave. Yeah, Coming cheers. back after New Year. And uh, we'll see you next week.